Hello everybody. Welcome to part two of the Minolta 110 Zoom SLR, which is less about the camera and more about the film. One thing I neglected to mention in the first video, got a nice carrying case and the original manual, missing the front cover, but otherwise intact. As I mentioned, my first roll in this camera was some Kodak VR uh, color print film that was in the camera with a few frames exposed. After I processed it, this is what it looked like. It's really, really dark, which is why I ignored it since last summer when I finished out the roll. The second roll that I shot was like this, it's the Lomography Color Slide X Pro uh, film. And this one I think is current. I'm not sure why I have two rolls of this. Um, the one that I shot in this camera uh, expired in 2006, I think. It's not the camera's fault, it may not even be the film's fault. I was also on about roll six on a set of slide chemicals uh, that's supposed to be good for four. It was a pint kit because I have a bad habit of letting the chemicals go bad. So I tried to buy in smaller quantity. The pint kit is not really enough to use in the tank that I normally use that can adjust down to 110 film. So I dug out this old guy it's a Yankee Clipper 2. It was part of my dad's kit. Not sure why he got it, because he had stainless steel rolls that he mostly used. Maybe it was just in case he had to do the occasional uh, 110. The web loves to hate on this tank, and it does have some pretty hideous quirks, but it's not that bad. Uh, first off, it can't be inverted because it's got these little pour holes here. This is a lot like an Ansco tank that I got in an ancient uh, develop at home kit. So you have to use the stir stick. So that's your agitation. And you can tell this is one of the original ones from the early 70s. It actually has the thermometer inside the stir stick. I guess modern ones have this space and no thermometer. The other thing that people really hate about this, um, it's got kind of ratcheting reels. I've got it adjusted down to 16 millimeter, but there are no ball bearings. Uh, it doesn't have the actual ratchet mechanism. So even though the reels do this, you have to slide it in like this. And that could be a giant pain. A trick I found online is just uh, snip the corners so that your leading edge is rounded a little bit, then it's pretty easy to get it in there. You do want to work fast because you're in a dark bag, you're sweating. If you work fast, you won't smudge your film too much. If you're already getting sweaty in there, it might be best to take a break and come back to it when your hands are nice and clean and dry. One thing that people hate about this tank that I have to agree is the holes coming out because of the way they're kind of convoluted to make the thing light tight, um, it pours out so slow. So you actually have to really take your pouring out time into consideration when you're timing your development. Anyway, that takes me to my third attempt, slitting down some 120 film to 16 millimeters so that I could reload it in a cartridge in here. And that brings us to this beastie, the Lego film slitter. So the next portion of this will kind of be a, a, a slideshow because I have a bunch of stills from version one and this version two of this. So let's get to it. Version one just had the razor blades braced front and back by Legos and used closed cell foam kind of as padding. Here you can see I'm kind of testing the output, making sure that the razor blades reach the foam. The paper was some old paper and I had some scrap 120 film. Here it's loaded in, ready to, to be slit. 
I used a roll to pull it and it seems to be coming out pretty well and this is the result cats love this stuff and this one came out about 15 and this one came out about 17 so eh, in the ballpark this is real film this is the t-max ready to go in and here it's ready to go into the dark bag the problem was that the drag from the film lifted the razor blades which bunched up the foam in the exit channel so I tied them down with some wire and supported the exit channel by making it a little wider thought about using closed cell foam again but I couldn't get it secure so I used this sticky backed felt from the hobby store and that seemed to be a little smoother it's a pretty decent exit there and that's the Ilford loaded up and ready to go in the dark bag. Switch back to my regular camera for the last part of this video. I use this little Canon for the first part. It takes nice video, but when you have it on a tripod, you can't get to the battery or the SD card, so it kind of biffs the workflow. So I'm back to my usual uh, little Nikon. So after I got it slit, I put the uh, slit film into black film canisters and then went to load it and 120 film is long enough for about 28 frames of uh, 110 film. I got greedy and used the 24 exposure backing paper from the Lomography and tried to load it in and First thing I learned was some of my raggedy cuts. It was too tall. I could not get the cartridge completely back together. So that's why I went for the edge marked one because it was the kind of scrap side end because this channel is wider than 120. So it was the thinnest one. Then I learned that 28 frames spooled on this big fat spindle in here is too fat. The big bundle of film plus the paper can't get it to move because it's wedged in here. So I finally learned my lesson. Used the backing paper from the old Kodak because it was 12 exposures. Took this in the dark bag with the slender cut uh, of the four slits and cut it to this length. Put it on the backing paper managed to get it spooled. I destroyed the Kodak cartridge getting it apart. Kodak was serious about the glue they used. And then the Lomography, I was in and out of it so many times, I cracked it in several places. So this is actually half Lomography spool and half of this old uh, 3M Scotch color. They fit together perfectly, so I guess Lomography got a hold of compatible or the same molds. So the height variation was still pretty bad. So the next revision of this, version three, I'm gonna move everything this way, move the cutter portion this way, and add a take-up spool that's mounted like this. Because having the spool here and pulling it through, that's where I got so much width variation. Because I was doing it in the dark bag, Maybe I pulled this way, maybe I pulled this way. So the film had a little bit of latitude to move back and forth. And the next thing I'm going to do is maybe with some felt, or I'm not sure what, if I've got some skinny Legos, I'm going to uh, bring this down to where it doesn't have quite as much slop with respect to the width of 120 film. And this is my... Uh, scanning setup. I taped it under tension wrong way up in the 120 film holder in my Canon scanner. It holds it at, a, at about the right focal distance. It's got a little bit of bow to it, but it scans pretty clean for being such a kludge. So I've got cans of really badly butchered uh, T-Max 100, you know, the plastic film canisters, and then I've got some that are a little too tall and they have a lot of variation of the SFX 200 
So what do you do with something that's around 16 millimeters but a little bit taller? A hit camera. They're 17 and a half so the variations hopefully will not matter as much on this little camera. Made some backing paper just for eight exposures since it's another experiment. So that'll be for another video and I will see you then.